Hey, I have an intro for this. Um, I have an intro for this show. As I said, we're only uh, we're only just started recording. I forgot that I have a, um, an intro. Oh yeah, cool. All right, so welcome to Too Weird to Live Too Rare to Die, a podcast telling stories of founders, investors, and operators working to turn the world we live in into a better place. Phoebe Gardner, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Cool. So, um, Phoebe, we'll uh, we'll jump in. Um, shortly, and and would love to hear um, all about Bardi, uh, formerly Beyond Ag, and and uh, and yeah, what you guys are doing. Um, before we do, we might just throw over to Wallow because Wallow has um, he's prepared a little uh, he's prepared a song for you. So um, let's see let's see how we go. Have you ever been sung to before yeah. on a podcast, Phoebe? You, is this the first or this is my first podcast? So oh wow, no. cool. cool. Yeah. Well, it's all downhill from here after this is, uh, this will be your podcast highlight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. So Phoebe, do you listen to Arctic Monkeys by any chance? Yeah. Cool. Cool. I guess that means you like this. Hopefully you do. <laughs> Let me share the lyrics with you so that you can laugh along because it's meant to be funny. <laughs> just just letting you guys all know this is meant to be funny <laughs> please please laugh fingers crossed <laughs> okay uh where is that okay here we go share uh okay so i have a beat i prepared because i made beats on site uh let's go so Composting is anyone trusting the black soldier flyers protein? When we composting, so here they be trusting the black soldier flyers protein. <laughs> Who is in the garden? Who is in your garden? Phoebe is in your garden. 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 There's another one, there's another verse that's coming. But it's simply with me. Okay. Vermi composting is anyone trusting the black soldier flyers protein? Vermi composting is anyone trusting the black soldier flyers protein? Who is in the garden? Who is in your garden? Phoebe is in your garden. Phoebe is in your garden. Who is in the garden? <laughs> How true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Dude, that was sick. Thanks, that thanks, was amazing. Thanks. That was so good. Thanks, that was thanks, the second thanks. the second verse, just upping the uh, upping the ante. Yeah. <laughs> That was literally the last thing I was expecting when I jumped on this call. <laughs> I loved it. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Nice, Wallo. Good start. Good start. Um, yeah. I don't know what uh, vermi composting is, but um, you know, I'm super keen to learn. Um, baby, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about um, who you are, a little bit of your background. Um, yeah, let's start there. Yeah, awesome. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bardi. And what we do is we transform food waste into protein and fertilizer with insects. And why we're doing it is to reshape the global food system. There's so many unsustainable food practices. And by 2050, we're going to have about 9 billion people on this earth. And we need to double food production in order to feed everyone. So being able to take the food that's already being produced and wasted and turning that back into a really sustainable protein that can go back into feeding our pets, animal feed, and one day us as well, um, as well as an organic fertilizer to help grow more crops sustainably as well is, is exactly why we do what we do. Wow. Cool. That's awesome. So how did you get to this point though? So <clears throat> not everybody kind of wakes up one morning and says, I want to reshape the global food system. You know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty large uh, undertaking. 
So, you know, I was flicking around through your LinkedIn and so forth before the show. We chatted, obviously, uh, last week, whenever it was, um, which was nice. But, um, like, what made you kind of passionate about this idea? What was your upbringing like? Were you, were you, you know, thinking about sustainability as a child, your family? Like, uh, yeah, how, 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 the, how did you get to here? Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. And you did ask a bit before about my background. And so I'll share a bit now. So I actually started out as an architect. So I studied architecture and maths at university. And then I went on and was incredibly lucky to end up working on some really big train station projects around the world. And one in Australia that was really interesting, which was in Sydney, the Central to Everly redevelopment plan. So a few new train stations coming in the future in Sydney and how they interlink into the community. And of course, transport is another big area for sustainability and increasing public transport and the usage of it can really make a big difference um, and make us less reliant on, on cars. It also has a lot of social benefits as well. Um, and so even when I was in architecture, I was really focused on being part of those sustainable projects. And mm -hmm. it was really interesting because when you work on those big projects, you start to learn how really big things get built in chaotic cities while they're still mm -hmm. fully functioning. Mm -hmm. And I was really lucky to be exposed to that super early in my career. And so when it came to making the leap to, oh, let's reshape the global food system, it didn't, it didn't really feel maybe quite as big as it, as it would have if I hadn't been exposed to some of those larger city scale projects in architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I read an interesting, uh, I read a, a cool article about um, taking big steps when you're, when you're younger, how it reshapes your um, appetite for risk and so forth. And, and uh, cause I bought um, real estate when I was young, uh, really, really young. So like my appetite for risk was, was changed at a really early age. And I think from what you're saying, like maybe your, um, your scale of project that you, that was possible in your mind is kind of probably a little bit different to, to most um, from your experience, I guess. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's exactly that. And I think everyone has a, a sort of path to getting really passionate about a certain area and finding mm -hmm. their why. And mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't happen sort of overnight. It really happens step by step. Um, and so for me, just being opened up to that world of big projects. And then I actually founded Bardi with my partner, Alex Arnold, who's an incredible mm -hmm. scientist. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what really brought me into the world of insects and the black soldier fly. Mm -hmm. So he's a geneticist and an entomologist. And more and more, um, I was becoming so fascinated and interested by the work he was doing in the space. And together, sort of every night at home, we were able to um, link our worlds together. So big city projects with insects and the incredible work in the labs that Alex was doing until we started to ask the question, what would it look like to process a whole city's food waste into something mm -hmm. useful? Mm -hmm. yeah. what, a, what a fortuitous uh, coupling. That's, uh, that's crazy that you guys were kind of just brought together, I guess, for because um, it's a pretty big problem, you know? It's a pretty big problem. If you guys... Hit the um, hit the nail on the head and reshape the global food system. It's a, it's a, it's a large undertaking with a huge impact. So, um, in Wallow's song, you know, he talked about vermicomposting, talked about the black soldier fly. I don't even really want know what protein is to be honest. But um, tell yeah. us about <laughs> tell us about how it actually works. So, um, because it sounds nice, uh, sounds awesome, really, but. How does it actually work? How does it, what are the processes that, that, that come into play and what is the output at the end? Yeah, let's do it. And I can definitely share how we work at Buddy. It's really unique the way we do it. Um, and I'll make a small note that vermicomposting is actually composting with worms. So vermi no, sure. is the word for worms. And I'm not, it's my co-founder, Alex, who's the insect expert. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, sharing a little a little bit there. So vermicomposting would be like what you, um, the soil you might get from your worm garden. If you're putting your food scraps from home into a worm farm, and that's really great for your soils and you can reuse it in that way. Um, what we do at Bardi is, is that on a, on a big scale, 
plus a whole lot of work in in labs to work on the improvement and optimization of the life cycle. So let's step back for a second. What happens at Bardi is that we have a big commercial pilot facility in Sunshine North in Melbourne, and we have food waste that's delivered in trucks um, every day. So Mm -hmm. that food waste is delivered by all your normal waste logistics companies And if it wasn't coming to us, it would usually otherwise be going to landfill where it breaks down into methane. But instead, it comes to us and we actually get paid to receive that food waste. And it's Mm -hmm. cheaper for the waste logistics companies to send it to us than to send it to landfill, which is really cool because we Mm -hmm. want to have as much food waste going into a sustainable process Mm -hmm. as possible. So it it comes in and then we actually have to decontaminate it and process it. So if you're ever putting a piece of plastic in a food waste bin or leaving a bit of a wrapper on, then it's, it's my team in Sunshine North (laughs) that's then pulling it out. Yeah. (laughs) Putting the the gloves on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we have a decontamination manufacturing line. um, And then we actually process that food waste into an ideal feed for our insects. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. So we then combine the insects at a particular point in their life cycle with the food waste and take them together into these incredible labs that we've built. So they're run um, remotely. We barely need to go in them and we control everything that happens inside them um, from sort of wind speed, uh, temperature, humidity, all mm-hmm. in, in little zones. Mm-hmm. And, but basically the, we'll, we'll put a ton of food waste into a lab and then with some insects with it. And a week later, there's no food waste. All the insects have done is they've grown 3000 times in size. So like from the Whoa. size of a grain of sand to like one of those jelly beans that you buy Whoa. at the chemist. That's crazy. And, yeah. um, also produce their manure. So at that point, there's no food waste left after less than seven days, just the insect and Mm -hmm. the insect's manure. And we take that Mm -hmm. out of the lab and then process the two different parts, the manure into our fertilizer product and the insect into our insect protein um, in different manufacturing lines that we've we've designed and and commissioned. mm. You know what, Phoebe? You are, you might be a genius. <laughs> I don't know about that. Is, that is one of the most insane stories. Oh my God. So, <laughs> all right. So one ton of food waste goes in, gets, turns into lots of healthy little insects with lots mm-hmm. of healthy little insect poop. And then, so how much of this one ton, uh, like what is that, what is that? output at the end like how much um fertilizer do you have how much insect protein like what can the what you what what you turn it into what can that do in the world if that makes sense yeah so we produce about half of that turns into product and that's because there's a mass reduction in that process Mm -hmm. we don't have to add any additional water in our system because it all comes from the food waste but in the process Mm -hmm. of the insects growing a lot of that water evaporates like they're working mm-hmm. hard, they're sweating in there. Oh yeah, and, um, sounds like it. <laughs> and so we food, lose a bit food of water. Sweats. Food <laughs> sweats. Oh my god, I had the meat sweats the other night. Actually, it was a terrible experience. <laughs> great, great, but terrible yeah. if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know the feeling. Um, mm. Yeah. So about half of that volume turns into product, and then the insect protein. By the time we've then further refined it into a dehydrated meal the carbon offset is 50 times its weight of the product. So one Mm -hmm. kilo of the insect protein we produce offsets 50 kilos of CO2 equivalents in carbon emissions. That's insane. Like that. Actually, I studied uh, civil engineering back in uni. We took a course on this environmental stuff and how we can use bugs to convert waste and everything. And so I, I kind of feel at home with what you're talking about, but like how scalable do you think it is? Because yeah, I understand that the myth, the methane that gets taken to the landfill 
is kind of it makes landfills worse like it makes it stink it makes the place messy and all of that and that's part of the carbon atom you guys extract from the using your insects so like how scalable do you think it can be if you if you have like a whole city's waste in like in body taking a whole city's waste so that the organic waste becomes like i don't know insects and insect poop and it's like how how big do you think you can get you know how, how much poop because, can you make yeah how much poop <laughs> that's amazing poop um okay so the we can currently process 10 tons of food waste in eight hours here into products Crazy. so that looks like maybe three or four waste trucks like the rubbish trucks you see driving down your week up uh, down your road that might be um that's about that volume tipped at our site so we can do that in eight hours and then the vision for us is to run this facility 24 hours a day seven days a week i mean the insects don't know it's the weekend so <laughs> give so them we... a break give them a break babes <laughs> Give them, a, <laughs> give them a Saturday off. <laughs> Far out. And, um, talk, about, talk about bad labor practices. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, they, they'd be upset. That's uh, eating, um, eating food waste is what they do. Maybe it's a good time to wow. talk about where this actual insect comes from. So the black soldier fly is actually from Florida um, originally. Mm. It's a, a tropical rainforest um, fly. And what their their job was, was to clean up the forest floor. So rotten fruits that would fall from trees um, and any other debris that's on the forest floor, that's what they've evolved to do. So when they're in our labs eating, they're, they're happy as ever just doing their thing. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. I reckon I could send Ziggy, my little uh, my little sausage dog, up to your lab. You know, maybe like on like a Thursday afternoon, and he'd probably be pretty at home too. He can eat until his heart stops. That little fella. So, <laughs> I get it. Don't worry, I get it. Um, hey, going back to Wallow's question um, around like the scalability and and so forth. So you mentioned um, you can process one ton per eight hours, and you want to be running twenty four seven. And what's that? Sorry, ten tons per eight hours. Ten. 10 tons, 10 tons per eight hours. Great. Mm -hmm. So say Melbourne, for example, how much food waste does Melbourne have per day or per eight hours? Like what capacity are you running mm. out in, in order to like actually knock Melbourne on the head? So this current facility that this commercial pilot facility we have now can process about 0.03% of Melbourne's food waste. So it's the it's very much just the start and so Jeez. the amount of food waste we're producing is just enormous and um our vision for body is to scale very quickly into being able to process a whole city's waste so that would look like a, a mega facility that's maybe 30 40 times larger than the commercial pilot that we have today mm -hmm. um Every, every bit counts in terms of we're building the technology, we're offsetting CO2 as we speak today at, at the mm -hmm. body commercial pilot in Sunshine. But really it's just the, just the beginning and, and just a start, um, a small dent into a massive problem that we really need to solve in order to, to live more sustainably and, and have sustainable cities. Yeah, for sure. So 0.03%, you said, that's what you're currently mm. processing. So how much of like... Future Bardi is going to be towards um, obviously <clears throat> scaling the processes that you have now. Is there also like a big push on the technology side to make your plants more efficient? Like if you could, for example, process in the same size factory, you know, 20 tons, is that, is that something that you think is possible in the future or, or 25 tons? Like is, if you think of like a computer, right? Computers started as, you know, the size of you know three football stadiums and now they're the size of it's a it's a totally different thing but is that like how you guys are thinking at at Bardi and and in terms of being able to do more with the the technology that you have yeah absolutely i mean we just have such an incredibly small footprint for what we do and uh, an example would be we already have six meter high labs where every square meter is being utilized for for one of the life stages of the insect mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's very much a, a beyond human reach and i think ultimately 
what we're looking at is a, a completely automated mega factory in this space. So at our current site in Sunshine, we have a, about 100 million individual insects at, at any one time. And then you start to imagine 30, 40 times that volume in, in almost like a blackout, fully automated facility in the future um, being quite incredible. And, and I think what's really amazing is that, I mean, we've got, we've got other businesses as, as neighbours and you can drive past and, and you just have Ooh. no idea what we're doing. You, you cannot smell it. <laughs> mm. yeah that's cool yeah definitely you yeah you and um i think you and elon musk are the only people that i've heard of that have mega factories <laughs> so that's another thing another thing another thing worth being <laughs> worth being worth being really proud of i feel like <laughs> i've always wanted there's to have a, a mega um, factory <laughs> there's I don't a, a there's factory. An amazon one <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah fair yeah. enough very cool um so so here's another thing. So talking about um, obviously what you're able to produ produce in terms of what you said was animal protein and fertilizer, right? They're the two mm -hmm. end products that, that Bardi kind of creates. So yeah, t talk to us about um, the benefits of eating insect protein. Like, you, you, you know, you always hear of um, the hunter-gatherer diet and, and that it was a you know foraging diet and we grew up on berries and, and insects and so forth. Like, what is the actual health benefits of eating? It sounds, it sounds to most people, and I mean, unless you're like, you know, hanging out in Byron Bay <laughs> drinking mushroom coffees, it kind of sounds a bit weird, the animal, uh, the, the insect protein thing, but it's super healthy, right? Like, wh what do you know about it? Yeah, it's incredibly healthy. And, and what's really interesting is that more and more academic research from all over the world, really, I think particularly in Europe, there's some amazing research allowing us to learn more and more about the future health benefits of incorporating more insects into our diet. I think the other thing to remember is that incorporating insects into an everyday diet is, is normal in about half of the world. Yeah. Um, particularly in like some of our, our neighbors in, in Southeast Asia, um, it's completely normal to incorporate insect protein in a diet. And it's really just in, in the West that, um, that it's, considered very new um mm -hmm. and in many ways in the in the west we're part of the move towards alternative proteins and mm -hmm. we have some insect protein has some um, some similar benefits to other alternative proteins of course there's the sustainability but also it's very hard to find very protein dense and like high caloric um proteins from um <laughs> in sustainable sources. And that's something that mm. insect protein offers, particularly in our system where it's actually eating waste that would have already gone to landfill. landfill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. At the moment, our protein goes into pet food. So a lot of the uh, sort of scientific knowledge around um, the insect protein that I have is, is really focused on that area. So gotcha. one of the r really exciting things about insect protein is that it's being found to be hypoallergenic in um it, for for dogs particularly has anyone got a dog that's ever had like a a skin allergy or been fussy on their foods i know our dog mm. is no nah, i haven't ziggy will eat anything and he has a nice yeah, same, here, same here my dog will eat anything <laughs> oh that's great but um yeah the insects themselves so there's that hypoallergenic um like protein that they can provide. And then from a nutritional perspective, it's incredibly similar to eating something like salmon or tuna mm -hmm. in terms of the nutritional value that an insect can provide. And, and that's what we aim for when we're developing our products here. Cool. Quick question. So have you had insects? Have you had, have you eaten insects? Oh yeah. Our whole team, we cook them and eat them all the time. I actually, cool. we have, cool. we have like, uh, you barbecues, know, those, um, barbecues at Bardi are just different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have like a, um, a little product lab here and we've got like a, a hamburger maker and the meatball maker and a oh, meal. Cool. Um, yeah. So we've tried all sorts of stuff. We had a tour here the other day with some awesome people um, who yeah. came and tried the insects in, in sort of all different ways. Um, we even have, you know, like staff team, like kitchen, you know, those uh, <clears throat> like nut dispensers that you turn yeah. 
and they like <laughs> drop out nuts into a into a cup. Um, so we have like fried insects with like herbs and spices on them. Oh, what? Um, oh, in our one, sick. yeah. Um, Bastard. what do you guys think it would taste like? <laughs> have you, have any of you eaten an insect? I haven't uh, eaten insects. Yeah, I was about to ask you, Walo, actually, because we were talking about weird stuff that you've eaten last time we recorded. What while I was in Nigeria, so the diet's different. I mean, have you what what about you? Like how much experience do you have while eating like what about I haven't? Well, the school I went to, it was in a separate it was owned by a separate tribe of Nigerians. So we went there and it was part of their diet. So sometimes when it rains, they just bring out bowls and catch some insects and fry them, put herbs and spices, like you said and serve them to us and they tasted almost milky i liked i really like them if i find them Hold i will on. eat them again i will keep them. <laughs> yeah. oh, awesome <laughs> if i find yeah. you i will eat <laughs> <laughs> it pains me that i know the meme it pains me so much that I know <laughs> yeah. It. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah okay. um yeah i've not eaten i don't think i've eaten insects in the past i know i think i i think i have i just can't remember where i've traveled a lot so i've, I've eaten weird stuff i just can't definitely can't think, but yeah definitely mm. i don't think we've had anyone um to the facility that which which we call the moon base our commercial pilot in in moon sunshine base. north um and so at the moon base i don't think anyone's come for a tour and not tried at least a few insects and people say all oh. sorts of different stuff about what it tastes like so <laughs> um some people say it tastes like eating prawns or eating mm. mushrooms i think it tastes like a really similar to eating like dried mushrooms um mm. someone another one that was really interesting um a couple of days ago someone said it tasted like eating like those dried peas like you know wasabi peas but without yeah, wasabi mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. but that's what it tasted like which i thought was a really interesting comparison but basically what everyone's picking up is the <laughs> glutamic acid so the insects themselves are really high in glutamic acid which is the umami savory flavor oh, cool. often called nature's msg um mm. so it, yeah they just taste really really savory and and yummy yeah yeah that's that's mad now i'm Um, looking forward to (laughs) what was that (laughs) i said now i'm looking forward to eating eating insects because i think one of my favorite tastes is umami actually so i can eat umami anything that tastes oh my god like i go to eat cheese i just go to eat cheese for example so yeah that's that's definitely <laughs> something I'm, I'm thinking about doing yeah um Doc, cool. you were about to ask a question were you yeah yeah i was just gonna say um so phoebe like a lot of the people that um will be listening to this show will be you know startup founders and operators and you know and so on and so forth um <clears throat> you got a pretty wild pretty wild story super super inspirational and like you know, raising money for a startup is notoriously hard. Uh, you know, people spend months and months and months uh, in order to, to do that, trying to prove that there's, you know, product market fit, trying to prove that the market's big enough, that it's an impactful enough, you know, thing to put a bunch of people's minds to. Um, I don't know whether, I'm trying to think of what your experience would have been like. And I'm super interested to hear because I don't know whether it was the hardest time on the face of the earth to raise money. <laughs> or the easiest i feel like it's one or the other um but what was the experience like trying to get this thing off the ground and trying to get some people to back you um what was that all like yeah and i'd love to come back and talk more in detail once we're sort of speaking a little bit more about our our journey here but i think we went through a raise quite early in our Mm -hmm. in our path and so i was a very very new to being a founder a first-time founder um and i'm just now very thankful looking back to all the sort of deep tech hardware founders who went before us and before me who really paved the way to make it so possible um, for me and accessible for me to um, step into the venture capital world and and to pitch and to to understand that space Um, because by the time uh, towards the end of 2019 there was really already so many incredible Australian deep Deep, deep tech companies out there um, who had raised that um, that really paved the way. 
I think. What are some examples? Us, Do you have any examples? Oh, I mean, there are some there are some incredible companies like uh, Morse Micro inventing the future of Wi-Fi, this new Wi-Fi chip. I mean, they've even hired the inventor of Wi-Fi on their team, um, oh. Michael Danil, the founder there. Just <laughs> incredible. I didn't even know there was an inventor of Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought and, Wi-Fi um, was kind of like was kind of like Jesus, you know, just. Um, I thought it was probably anyway, some no, military sorry. thing. No, just yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't and know more, some, some bloke. <laughs> and enough. then more in the um, alternative protein space, there's an incredible company in Australia called Val, um, and they're doing uh, cultured meats or cellular meats. They, they actually write really incredibly. They have amazing blogs um, about Val sick, yeah. that space. I've, yeah, they're I such incredible company. I listened to a podcast with, um, with Val, I think, the other day. might have been – maybe it was on – the Blackbird podcast or somewhere. Um, yeah, listen to the story of our super. That that stuff gets me real, real pumped is the alternative protein, the cultured, cultured meat. Um, mm. Yeah. I'm real I'm real bullish on on that industry. Um, I really think it's going to change change the world. It's really, really, really great. So yeah, but continue, go on. Yeah, so I mean, I think the big thing for us was we, were, we weren't waiting to get funding. We were just jumping in straight away and doing it. So what we did is as soon as um, Alex and I decided like, yep, this is the best thing we think we can do. This is our thing and the way we believe we have a chance to contribute to the world really meaningfully, we just went 100% in. I think it's, it was really funny. We were like, no one's ever going to take us seriously unless we have an ABN and register for GST. <laughs> so literally on day one when we decided, to, you know, like just in ideation stage, we registered um, our ABN and for GST, which I think is so funny now. Um, it must have been like 2 a.m. <laughs> and, um, and then we applied to be in an accelerator. So we were super, super fortunate to be a really early company in the Melbourne Accelerator Program. And they, mm. at that point, offered 20K equity-free cash to be in that accelerator. Boom. Yeah. So that Cash was our money. start. So we <laughs> yeah, yeah. we spent every bit of that on these secondhand lab panels, and mm-hmm. the University of Melbourne also actually gave us this little space. So like tiny sixty square meters of gravel on one of their campuses in the city. And Alex and I, we to get started, we um we had to level the gravel first. So we went and hired from like Kennard's higher, a laser level, and then spent a weekend rolling on the gravel until it was flat <laughs> so that we could um, put these secondhand panels up and build our, our first lab, which we called the spaceship. Ooh. And so I think <laughs> I was in that accelerator program and through that, I was learning about different types of growth and more and more we were aligning with um, high growth venture capital because I think it's this incredible time in the world where um, sort of capitalism and and venture capital in particular, like really high growth models um, align with the timeline of of climate change and the need for Mm. change Mm. to make a more sustainable future. So that our alignment was really easy to see. And so when I was speaking to VCs um, and, and looking, starting to look to raise, um, what I was doing was I was going out and talking about like, hey, we're, we're doing this. We've already done it. Like, this is what I did on the weekend. Um, here's the pitch. Here's the photos. This is what it's going to be. Um, this is how we're sequencing the journey, building strength along the way, talking to customers. And so um, in that sense, I just really wanted people to understand what we were doing. And, and I really had this sense that we, we would find a way to do this no matter what. And so I think that mm-hmm. when it came to raising, it made it really quite, um, like, how do I say this? Like, it, it made it easy to join people in on that journey yep. because it was mm-hmm. already yep. happening. We weren't waiting to get capital to start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's great. That's great. Um, hey, one thing um, that you mentioned earlier, and you, you mentioned it again now, that I uh, I wanted to ask initially was, um, what's the what's the process of the relationship like? So, you're the boss in the day. Are you the boss at night as well, or like how's the the, the dynamic? How's it how's it work? Um, <laughs> co-founding something with your with your partner. <laughs> um. I think it's really it's really amazing, and Alex and I have been together for 
maybe five years before we founded Bardi. And Mm -hmm. when you're building um, like a relationship with a life partner, we never expected to then that to become a platform for, you know, doing our life's work, Mm -hmm. but, but it did. And and it's something that we didn't necessarily expect. And it's something that's really amazing. Um, I think, so we have a board and so Alex and I, as the founders, we both sit on the board. Mm -hmm. And so there's this amazing um, dynamic, I think, where we have to wear multiple hats. So yeah, functionally during the day, I lead Barty as the CEO. And I think more and more as the team grows and I grow, I'm, I'm able to step into that CEO role, that sort of transition from, from founder into CEO. Yep. Um, and, but then I report to Alex on the board and to myself. Interesting. And so I think for us, it's just being really clear on like which hat we're wearing at mm-hmm. what time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just have such enormous respect for Alex and everyone in, in our team's um, ability to, to deliver what we're doing that I find it really easy for us to work together. Um, such incredible skill sets. We, we work with a very high level of autonomy throughout our team. So I think, I think it's been really amazing to have an opportunity to see your partner thrive in the way that we get to see each other at Barty. Yeah. Mm. Sounds cool. Amazing. So good. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, we know you have to <clears throat> um, be out of here short-ishly. Um, going to throw over to Walla. Walla, you got to, um, we have a few questions. Um, Walla has a few things prepared that we, we normally go over. And then I'll probably got one one question I'll probably wrap, up, wrap us up with. But over to you, Walla. These aren't going to be, okay. these are going to be sp- spoken word, not not um, <laughs> song, and, song and dance. So you only get one song, unfortunately, on uh on the show, yeah. baby. No second <laughs> song for you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what what book or books have impacted your life the most? I guess is that a heavy one. Mm, I hope not. I'm obsessed <laughs> with reading, and um, we have eight different labs at Body, and as a team, we named them, and a couple of them we actually named after books. And so one of our labs where the insects grow and transform the food waste into mm-hmm. the protein and the fertilizer is called Spring, and that is from the book by Rachel Carson called A Silent Spring, and it's just an incredible book talking about sustainable agriculture and written Mm. by Rachel Carson in America at the time of industrialized agriculture when um, GMO seeds and synthetic fertilizers were being introduced um, and Mm. really founded the sustainable food um, movement as as we see it today. So, yeah, I think The Silent Spring by Rachel Carson is just incredible, such a classic. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, so what, hmm, can you tell me one tool that you can't live without? You or your business can't live without? Slack. Slack is amazing. <laughs> um, we have such a diverse team at Body. So at 14 people, we had eight different first languages. And so cool. what that means is we often have a preference for written language. So mm. we'll have a meeting and then we'll be have very direct comps on action items, timelines that are written. And Slack's just so incredible for us um, in that respect. Cool, cool. Um, this question might be heavy. I hope it's not. I, I really do. <laughs> I actually asked Doc this question and he couldn't answer it immediately. So maybe, I don't know. I hope it's not. <laughs> uh, so what advice would you give to people about work, but like not work? Like how would you, what do you think is the most important thing aside your work from you that you think people shouldn't neglect basically? I hope the question is clear. Can I rephrase it? If you the the second clear? half of that question was a good question. The first half of that question <laughs> was the most confusing. No, <laughs> sorry, well, I just want to just want to just throw a little little jab in there for you. I just want to. Yeah, I, 
I received my <laughs> okay. okay. Um, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the second half, and let me know if I've understood the question correctly. Um, so what's in, what's important to know about? Is it me or what I think generally in terms of giving advice between like work and self? That means I like question asking. <laughs> yeah. That, that means, Have another go, Wallow. Okay. Third, third time me, lucky, Let mate. me refresh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Me. It's, 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 it's on me. It's on me. Um, hmm. What do you think people should care about as much as they care about their work? As entrepreneurs, what sh- what else do you think we should care about? Like, what shouldn't we lose sight of, you know, mm. in our lives? Uh, yeah, I everyone. think I think for me that's an amazing question, and I think the thing for me would be, and and I think I, I reflect on my whole team as well, and just our, our our approach to not just the problems that we face at Barty, but all of the problems that, that you face as you go through, um, yeah. go through life together. Um, and I think it's really just about curiosity and learning. So I'm always coming to problems with this idea of I'm here to learn and I'm, I'm not concerned <laughs> if I'm getting it wrong most of the time, hmm. but um, having that approach that, you know, we're always learning and taking on, that mindset I think is probably the most most important thing and if that's your your number one um you know I can work and and have all sorts of challenges and and make both easy and difficult decisions during the day and then I I love music so I go home and I play music and I'm again like I'm still experiencing such joy from playing that music because it's another opportunity to learn um Mm. and I find so much energy in that so no matter what I'm I'm doing um that that draws me to sort of do more and and just yeah enjoy the process along the way yeah definitely I support that yeah that was actually a pretty good question in there what was your answer what was your answer what was my answer? I don't even remember what Doc, my answer was. Doc went to eat breakfast when I asked him that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think while I was saying I couldn't answer it, I couldn't answer it easily. My answer to that, what would my answer to that be? Um, I get caught up. I'm, I'm obviously a founder and, uh, and CEO also and have a team that's growing and, and everything's moving fast and so forth. And I get <clears throat> my answer would be, I mean, I have to remember that I have a life outside of work. It's very easy for me. I'm in the fortuitous position that I am really happy every Friday afternoon that comes around. I'm like, oh, wow, weekend's coming up. And then every Sunday afternoon, I'm like, oh, awesome. Monday morning tomorrow, get to rip into <laughs> Athena work. You know, So that's an amazing position to be in. Um, work is fun to me. Like the guys on the call, Matthias and Wallo, like we're all creatives. I think of Athena as a big piece of art myself. And like, yeah. so for me, like Amazing. getting in and getting, getting in and doing work is like, it's the, it's, it's probably the funnest thing that I do. So, so I, my thing that I, to answer that question is uh, I have to always remember that there's a lot outside of what I do. Cause even though I love it, it's me sitting at a computer a lot. It's, there's not a whole lot of personal human interaction face to face so you know i have to try and structure all right cool i'm a member at urban surf so i go surf the wave park with my mate luke all right cool i'm gonna go sign up to this gym i'm gonna pay 200 bucks a month to do it but i know if i do i'm gonna go three days a week not to get strong and and fit or whatever but to like be around people so so i have to try and remember that i have a life outside of work that's my my thing because because no matter how good work is, if you take your eyes off the fact that you have other relationships around you outside of work and they start to deteriorate, then, you know, work becomes hard. You start doing a poor job and things become not that much fun. So that would be my answer. Um, <clears throat> mm. Mm. Oh, and I, I like want to add now. You took time. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just want to add, um, Doc, you were talking about like structure in your calendar briefly. And I want to add that um, my, the other tool that I'm obsessed with is just super basic Google Calendar. Like I yes, yeah. I put every single thing I do in Google Calendar down to a yeah. five-minute five minute thing. Um, 
Cool. Just I and I don't have a to do list as a result. So oh. if I want to switch tasks, I go and put it somewhere else. So if someone comes up and he's like, "Hey, can we do have this chat?" I'll be like, "Yep, one sec." I'll look in my calendar and then I'll be like, oh, cool. So I'm going to have to move what I'm doing right now to 5 a.m. Do I feel good about that? Five, getting up 5 a.m. to do this tomorrow instead so I can have this chat. Yep. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> I was going to say, is the answer ever yes? <laughs> 5 a.m. is pretty bloody it's, early. It's usually <laughs> nah, yes. That's great. It's, it's usually that's great. yes. Sometimes it's no, but it helps you, helps you prioritize, helps me prioritize um, and just keep things centralized. But I, I, speaking amazing. to that kind of structure you were talking about, I even have yeah, like yeah. call mom in there <laughs> <laughs> every yeah, week. I put um, <laughs> I put um, I put reminders in my um, in my tasks in the CRM to like call family members and stuff like that, <laughs> which is pretty funny because I know that I always check the CRM when I know that I when I have to make calls to like important stuff business wise. Um, hey, we know we got to get you out of here, um, Phoebe. So I have one question. Just to, uh, in, and obviously, um, it's quite could be quite a expansive question, but but um, so so if we were to catch up in five or ten years time, say we bump into each other, um, we're at a bar, you're with a couple of couple of mates, you know, uh, we we bump into each other, and you're telling me what you've been up to the last five or ten years, you know, what do you want to be saying? <laughs> Mm, oh, such such a good question. I think it's actually a really easy one for me. Um, and I'll go for 10 years. So cool. in 10 years, what I would love to be talking about is the next mega factory we're bringing online somewhere incredible in the world. Um, maybe it's not Australia. I, I'm, I'm thinking it's overseas. And... Mm -hmm talking about hopefully human food consumption of sustainable proteins. I think that's still going to be insect protein, but it, it could be a mm -hmm. different alternative protein, but let's say insect mm -hmm. protein and talking about the, you know, incredible products and the sustainability that, that they're having the reach. I think 10 years is a really amazing time frame to think about um, because so many attitudes can change. Yeah. Like I think about how I thought and, and what the world was like 10 years ago. And Oof. yeah, and, and there's so many incredible different. technologies coming online. Um, no, it makes me incredibly excited even now just to think about what we could be talking about um, as we yeah. grab a drink. Well, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? They say normally you overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in 10. So if you've underestimated what you've told us there, that's, that's even more exciting. So um, yeah. I'm sure it's going to be going to be amazing. So um, a quickly, where can people find more about Bardi? Um, anything you want to plug? Like where, uh, where can people find any questions, comments, like cool things they want to see for your journey? Yeah, I mean, I said we're in stealth mode before and I meant it. We have a landing page website called Bardi.com. <laughs> um, it's got our mission on it, reshaping the global food system. That's it. Um, but if you visit it in a couple of weeks' time, so maybe when this podcast is out, we have an incredible new website sharing our mission, our carbon impact, where awesome. you can find products that Ooh, have our ingredients cool. in them. Wow. Um, yeah, it's all happening. So check out the website when it's up in a couple of weeks. <laughs> cool. Nice. Great nice. stuff. Oh, Great you. stuff. All right. Well, thanks so much, Phoebe. That's super inspirational stuff, like amazing problem to be solving and sounds like you're doing an excellent job, um, you know, steering the ship. So really glad to have um, had you on the show. Great job, Wilo. Um, great job, Matthias, in the background there. Big props <laughs> to the boys. Um, yeah. yeah, that's it from us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And especially thank you for the song. Super special <laughs> and unexpected. <laughs> thanks, Wilo. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, cool. everyone. Thanks, baby. Yeah. Ciao, Bye. Ciao.